even sure how to do recording. Yep, I got it. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, there's also a lot to cover in 50 minutes, so we probably won't get through it all. This is normally what, Graham, a two to three hour, <clears throat> probably a half day presentation so that we'll do the best we can in 50 minutes. We might go a little long for anybody that wants to stay over uh, after uh, an hour of this. <clears throat> Please ask questions as we go along. Do that in the chat if you know how to do the chat. We will take time at the end for uh, voice questions if you have that. And then also, Graham, maybe explain right up front here, certified arborist. There is a CEU today. Uh, so please stay on at the end of the program, and Graham will have some forms uh, pop up to get that information from them. Yeah, you bet. This is part of a workshop series. So, hey, if you're really anxious to learn about pruning, uh, we've got Graham here today, and he's going to be out on site in a couple of these places, uh, Waverly next week, Schuyler in two weeks, then there's some workshops in Sutherland and Eustis, March 21st and 28th. All of these things are gonna hone in hard on tree pruning. So come to one of these workshops if you'd like, get your hands a little dirty as we actually go outside and prune a little. I will highlight then April 13th, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but April 13th is kind of a follow-up to this event. We'll go outside, that's a Saturday, uh, in Waverly, where I live in Wayne Park, anybody that wants to come about 10 o'clock, we'll walk through and do some pruning. Anybody who wants to sharpen their skills. And you can learn more about that at uh, unl.edu slash workshops. All of those are the places that's where you're going to register for those events. OK, right up front, we're going to caution you. This is a presentation about young tree pruning. Uh, small branches, typically less than two inches in caliper or diameter, and we're working from the ground. Don't work from a ladder. <laughs> Don't get hurt. And for larger trees, please just work with a qualified arborist. But this really is probably the most critical time to be working on trees when they're reachable from the ground and they have small branches and you can really see their structure and make a huge positive impact into their future. I have a picture here on the left of a tree, uh, my neighbor just down the block. This is a cautionary picture, poor old Dave. He was pruning that green ash tree last, late last summer. He, took, he was trying to take a big branch out of it. He was up on a ladder. The branch knocked him out of that ladder. He landed on his concrete sidewalk. He broke two vertebrae in his neck. He had his neck fused. He nearly died uh, that day. Thankfully, he's still around, that stubborn old German. He's a good neighbor, but uh, he just about died. And poor Dave, I got to make fun of him here. He, the year before he took a branch out of that tree, he didn't want to hire an arborist. So we're not talking about <clears throat> these branches that are 12 inches in diameter. Get somebody who knows what they're doing to do that. He ripped that branch out of his tree a year or two before. So we got to have a talk with Dave. <clears throat> There are several online pruning guides and resources uh, that you can click to and just get all kinds of great information. Graham Herbst here today wrote the guide on the Nebraska Forest Service website. There's a link there. And then I wanna point out Ed Gilman, the work he does out of the University of Florida. He has it all online for free and he even wrote a book about it. So if you wanna get kind of the basics of all of this deep dive stuff, just seek out Ed Gilman resources on pruning. It's all free. I have a link in the chat to a document that I pulled together, just the key concepts and recommendations that I think about in pruning. So maybe those top 10 or 20 things to keep in mind. It's a good guide to keep in your pocket. And there should be a link in the chat here for you to click on it and download it and just Hope that it makes sense. And please give me feedback if something doesn't sound right in that little guide. <clears throat> but quickly, let's just think about the basic things we're gonna try and tell a novice or a homeowner that you're gonna be thinking about in pruning. And here are my top 10. Number one, prune for good reasons, good structure, safety, and clearance. Number two, uh, two there, for most shade trees, strive for a central leader while removing or reducing co-dominant leaders. 
that's a real big primary activity on young tree pruning. Deal with weak branches and included bark. Anticipate the future form or how much you're gonna have to raise the canopy of that tree and how you're gonna do that over time. Know a, a tree's natural growth habit. It's really important to know that some trees grow differently and you don't prune them the same way. Know a removal cut from a reduction cut. Use the three cut method for larger branches. Prune branches before they get too large. Don't cut into the branch collar. We're gonna really uh, hone in on that. And then prune anytime in small doses, as Graham said, when the saw is sharp, uh, about any time, but late winter and early spring for larger uh, pruning activities, if you can do it right now, this time of year. And then we mentioned that the science of pruning is always evolving. So tune back in in a couple of years and we'll update you on what we've learned. Okay, quick, why do we prune trees? Trees grew for millions of years, evolved without us pruning on them. So why in the heck do we think we need to prune on them? Well, when you stop and think about it, it's because we want trees around us and we want them to be healthy and long lived, structurally sound and safe because we plant trees, the trees we're pruning on are in our communities or in our yards and in our neighborhoods. We need them to be safe and well-structured and not coming apart in storms. So if you think about trees in the forest versus trees on the landscape that we plant, those trees in the forest, they're tight and they're pushed skyward by all that competition. And they're also buffeted from storms as each other uh, are so tightly together. The trees out in the environment that we plant though, they're usually scattered wide apart. They're lower growing and often wider growing than they would naturally be. They have big low branches that may be structurally unsound and then they're less protected from storms. So in our communities, we gotta be a little proactive to make sure our trees are gonna be storm resilient. And then one of the big things we're, we're thinking about always is just improving our practices as we do this. Uh, 40 years ago, or even when I was just getting started, flush cutting and stub cutting were pretty common. And we've learned that that's not the way to do it. And then also topping was quite common when I was uh, just getting started. And, and now we're really moving past uh, doing any of that. We've learned right on um, the money that that's a horrible way to prune trees. So the primary pruning goal for all of this is tree function and safety in the urban environment or the places we live, work, and play. We want to assist trees in developing good form. And here's just a few objectives we're trying to achieve as we prune on trees. We want to remove co-dominant leaders, raise the canopy for clearance where necessary, not always, but when necessary, Roofs, remove those damaged, crossed, or rubbing, or deformed branches, prevent storm damage and clean up from storms, remove sprouts and suckers, prune out insects and diseases. There's not a whole lot of that that happens, but things like black knot come along that we can prune out of some trees. Influence uh, flower or fruit production, and then improve views and aesthetics if we're thinking about that in moderation. Don't prune on trees because you think you can make them a better, uh, better artistically. That shouldn't be your goal. Uh, the tree primarily knows how it wants to grow and we just need to aid it along. Here's a caution though, before pruning, keep in mind that pruning creates wounds that are entry points for disease and insects and decay. Trees don't technically heal from these wounds, but they wall the wounds off with new growth and that process takes energy. I feel that it's a little pedantic to say that trees don't heal. I personally say, yes, trees do some healing, but that's not the way humans do, but they are walling off that injury to prevent further decay. A few other things to keep in mind, pruning removes stored food and reduces food production. Pruning disrupts the structural balance. Over pruning can cause problems. And then branches are easy to remove, but harder to put back on impossible to put back on. Over pruning is easy to do and I've done a lot of it in my life, but so is under pruning and I've done a lot of that in my life. So I kind of vacillate between less pruning, more pruning, less pruning, more pruning. 
Next, uh, this year, it's quite a bit more pruning. Next year, I might say, put the saw away, people. Trees have it figured, <laughs> have it figured out better than we think. But primarily the big pruning goal, minimize the amount of excessive wounding and limb removal. So big objectives, reduce structural issues that cause tree branch and uh, failure, tree or branch failures. The big two are gonna be co-dominant stems and leaders. If you look on this tree on the right, this is a hybrid Freeman maple on the campus of the university. And these trees, are just genetically programmed to have these really tight included branches growing up as multiple leaders. You'll probably never prune them all out of it, but you wanna give a tree like this better structure, fewer co-dominant leaders. You wanna take care of weak structural branches and especially those with included bark. And included bark is just bark that's pinched between two branches growing tightly together that is where we have weak branch unions that come apart in storms. And then maybe grossly unbalanced canopies or large low branches that just are way too big for the size of the tree. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but as we go along, you'll hear some terms uh, that come up here like central leader, codominant branches, the included bark we just mentioned, scaffold branches, lateral branches, subordination, suckers, water sprouts, and root sprouts, topping and tipping, stub cut, and flush cut. We're not going to spend a lot of time on any of these things, but some of them are more important than others, especially the central leader and co-dominant leaders. So if you can see my arrow uh, here on the left, my mouse cursor, right up the middle of the tree is that central leader. If we had another one coming off to the side, we'd call that a co-dominant branch or a co-dominant leader. And we'll touch on that a little bit more. <clears throat> Here's a big one, really, for what I've come around to in my life, trees in the landscape. So many of them end up with co-dominant leaders that come apart in storms. So we just have to take care of that early in its life. This tree on the left, it's still at a size to take care of. This tree in the middle, uh, all bets are off. Graham, would you do anything on that tree in the middle? Yeah, you know, I'd say that that tree in the middle, you could probably reduce one of those two leaders a little bit. And what you know, what what I find really fascinating still today is that when we, when we prune a branch, we're not only taking weight and length off of the branch that we pruned, but we're also affecting the future growth rate of that branch that we pruned. So we're not only making a difference today, but we're changing that balance of energy uh, being put into those two leaders. And, and imbalancing a little bit so that the one that we want to be the, the trunk of the tree, so to speak, can do that. And the other one is not gonna continue to get as long and thick uh, at the same rate as the other. So that's one way we can reduce the chance of having a failure right there where all that bark inclusion is. Awesome, yep, awesome. So, right, that tree may be workable to keep it long lived. We just don't see the top. so it's a little hard to say. It looks to me like a beech or a yellow wood, and those two species are really difficult to control this in, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Hey, if you go back one slide real quick, Justin. Yeah. It looks like on the right side that you've actually got a bunch of roots growing out of that, that branch union. Is that, is that right? Oh, boy, I wouldn't think so. I think it just fell off of there from that storm. And it's just kind of fibrous. Uh, but yeah, you wonder what's going on there, right? Yeah, I think sometimes when you have that that tight branch angle in there, you could get leaf debris that breaks down over time and then water that accumulates in there. Yeah. That, you know, I could see that potentially initiating some rooting, uh, but I'm not sure if that's what we're looking at in this case or not. Are you able to see my cursor, Graham? Yeah, yep. Yeah, you're talking about all that water and debris right in these pinched, uh, yeah. pinched uh, trunk unions. So. Yeah, exactly. So included bark is pinched between two stems. It's a sign of weakness here on the left is what that looks like in cross section. And generally you, when you have two stems growing out near each other on a tree here on the upper right, a U-shaped union is better than a V-shaped union. And then on the lower right is just what that looks like, a, a branch that we would try to prune out or tip back to reduce the load on. This is just what happens with older trees. And when we get into storms, when they, a primary trunk or leader has included bark, 
this is really a critical thing to think about. Included bark and co-dominant stems. We can't stress that enough for most shade trees, tall growing shade trees. Ornamental trees are a different animal. And then there are some shade trees you'll never prune that out of, and we'll talk about that. So the ideal time to prune is when trees are young, usually within the first 10 years of their life. And then I say about 15 feet up, because I got a pole saw that can reach about 15 feet into that canopy. Beyond that, you'd have to use a ladder. That's pretty unsafe. So that's when you hire uh, arborists who know what they're doing. When trees are young, this is the best time to establish proper spacing of those scaffold limbs. The scaffold limbs are the permanent limbs that are going to be the important laterally spreading limbs off that tree in its long life. In this tree in the picture, depending on where it is, none of those limbs might be a scaffold limb forever. They may be temporary, but one or two of them may be a scaffold limb to think about. And here's a graphic to show you to think about what are our, gonna be our permanent limbs. Look at the tree on the left, five to 10 years old, it's already 12 to 15 feet tall. And it may be that none of those lateral branches are gonna be permanent scaffold limbs. A few years later, here it is on the right, that's about the end of the size of the tree that we can reach with a pole saw and maybe do things from the ground. And then here in the middle, 30 to 40 years later, if you've done it right, you can see that all those scaffold limbs happened way after the tree was uh, in its infancy. So just be hey, aware Justin, of that. This, this is a good slide for addressing a question we had in the chat. When we, yeah. when we were looking at those co-dominant leaders a couple slides back, there was a question about where a person would actually cut one of those two leaders uh, to make a reduction cut on it. And I think this slide demonstrates that fairly well. So the general rule of thumb for Jane and, and anyone else that's curious is when we're doing a reduction cut on a branch, we want to cut back to a lateral branch that's at least about a third the size of what we're cutting off. Yeah. So, so what Justin's pointing at right now, these dashed lines are branches that could have been uh, cut off. Um, some of them are reduction cuts, some are removals. Yeah, that one right there is a great example where um, we're, we're cutting back the, the major leader in the branch and we're cutting back to something that's significant. We're not going to leave a stub. We're not going to cut back to a, a minuscule little bud. We're going to cut back to a branch that's a substantial size and orientation for what we want the tree to be doing. So if the branch we were cutting back to was jutting back into the canopy, that wouldn't really be uh, desirable as well. Thanks, Graham. And I'll have a couple images too where Graham can really dive in on what we're trying to do on that regard. So good questions. That's perfect, guys. Thanks for asking that one. Pruning rules of thumb, just a few for what I would throw at you. Develop or maintain, just like we said, this central dominant leader as high up the tree as possible. This varies by species. A pin oak, you're going to get a central leader 50 feet up into the canopy. A bur oak, not. <laughs> Maybe 15 feet up in the canopy or 20 on a bur oak. Identify the lowest branch in that permanent canopy and prevent low branches below that from growing too large. Space scaffold branches evenly along the trunk. Graham, I usually hear about 18 inches apart, but that's a, uh, just a general rule, right? Not a hard and fast rule. We don't want our side branches to become any larger than about half the trunk diameter. If you start getting side branches that are as big as the trunk, we got to reduce those the weight on those probably out further on the branch. Suppress growth on branches with included bark, prune away rubbing and crossing branches. And then when thinking about the pruning dose, they often say do not remove more than about a third of the canopy or living crown at one time. That's not a hard and fast rule, but especially on fast growing trees like an elm, you may take more off of that than, than one third, but that's a rough idea to keep in mind. The canopy ratio is another rough general idea for most trees. If we want them to look properly in the landscape, we don't want them to be a lollipop with all the branches up top and a great big exposed trunk unless there's a certain uh, site situation. So remember the two thirds rule for young trees and maybe three fourths for older trees. Not a hard and fast rule, but generally something to think about. 
Develop that strong central leader. We talked about this already, but we're gonna do reduction pruning or removal pruning. If we have a tree like this on the left, look at how many competing leaders we have coming up alongside of the main uh, central leader. These are two leaders or two branches on the left and on the right that need to be reduced. And then these dash lines on the middle image show where they would make those cuts. And Graham was just talking about some of these are reduction cuts and some of them are removal cuts. So these are primarily removal cuts here, a reduction cut here. Uh, you don't have to perfectly know that, but if you get a feel for what they're trying to do, look at all that went away in those dashed lines. And now, like Graham said, that energy is pushed back into the central trunk of the tree and hopefully it'll grow faster and bigger and suppress the size of those side branches. And this is just a graphic of how they do that with a tree in the field. Uh, reduction pruning to push that central growth. Here's an elm tree with all kinds of weird uh, competing leaders on it. This is going to take a lot of work, probably over what, Graham, three or four years to, to figure out. But you're going to do some pretty aggressive pruning right here year one uh, to reduce some of these competing leaders off to the side. So you can see they're working at it pretty hard. And then here's kind of a follow-up picture of something very similar where they took off these competing leaders on the side, reduced the size of those branches. And this is what it looked like in the second year uh, of how they cleaned that up. Now they're gonna come back a year or two later and probably do more of that. We can see up here in the top, we're already getting more competing leaders that are gonna need to be addressed at some form at some time. I mentioned to you that species type matters. Uh, trees that are upright like a pin oak or a linden, uh, certain maples, they're called excurrent. It's easier to keep that central leader all the way up. Decurrent trees that become rounded in time like a hackberry or a bur oak are a little bit different. But generally speaking, uh, if you have a tree in the landscape in your backyard that you wanna be underneath, you need canopy above, you're trying to push a central leader and good structure as high into that tree as you can. But consider these trees natural form, know a little bit about some of these species that are really hard to achieve this on. I'll throw out a few coffee tree, yellow woods, Elkova, Ohio buckeye, Freeman maple, beeches, some elms are hard, lace bark pine, and then almost any ornamental tree you can't push that central leader very high. You you'll never prune your way out of all of it. Here's just a couple examples. On the left is a ginkgo tree in the neighborhood here near East Campus. Uh, ginkgos are hard to get a, a real tall central leader on most trees. You get a lot of low uh, canopy competing stems in a ginkgo, and I don't think you can compete your, uh, prune your way completely out of it. The ginkgo, the zelkova here in the middle, and then this autumn blaze maple on the right. Sometimes you just have to put the saw down and uh, cut your losses and say, we're gonna watch that tree and do, just do the best we can. Here's a coffee tree. My gosh, what are you gonna do to a coffee tree on campus? They have very few structural limbs in the canopy. So if you take out all the worst competing limbs, you're left with nothing in structure or uh, leaf canopy, right? So you don't have much food production. This tree is big enough right by our building here that we wanna come in probably and remove these lowest branches or at least reduce them, remove or reduce the weight on them and push this tree up high, get that canopy out a little higher. And then adjacent to the building, we probably want to be able to see through this tree would be my guess. If it was in the back of the yard, we probably wouldn't worry about removing those low branches. I hope that makes sense to you. Elm trees, we get a lot of elms now planted again. They're fast growing trees with some pretty wild branching from time to time. American elm on the left, Accolade elm here in the middle, Triumph elm on the right. Let's just give you this general rule, prune elms aggressively when they're young. You're gonna have a lot of competing leaders, a lot of included bark, and they come apart in storms if you don't keep up with that, especially Valley Forge elm. Here on the lower right, don't plant that tree. It's a uh, storm-prone mess. 
when we're planting near sidewalks and streets, we might have to raise the canopy. And this is just the idea of how you would do that over time. Generally, you would do that over four or five or six year period. Here they've raised the canopy pretty aggressively on this tree. Maybe it's near a sidewalk or a street. And they took off several of these lower uh, important branches. It would have been nice if they didn't have to make that big of a cut. And yet there's ways to do that by doing it a little more uh, diplomatically when the tree is young. But this is the idea of raising that canopy where you need clearance under that tree. It's important to think about what the level of that canopy will be early in this tree's life. So you can start getting branches when they're one or two inches and not four or five if you have to limit up over the sidewalk here on the left. That Miyabi maple out in Waverly in our park, I had to take big branches off to get it away from that sidewalk. I was asleep at the wheel. And then here on the right, look at this live oak tree in a parking lot. Uh, they've had to limit up pretty aggressively in a parking lot for clearance and safety and all those things. So. But think about this, when you plant that tree, even if you're gonna raise that canopy up over the first few years of its life, it's important to keep young branches or low branches on a young tree uh, early in its life. Lower branches contribute to trunk taper and strength of the tree. Low temporary branches uh, help provide food for the tree and help get it off to a better start. So if you can leave these branches on, low on the uh, trunk for several years, and one thing you might think about, this is where you get to be a little destructive and less perfect in your pruning. You can tip some of these branches. That means cutting them right in the middle or to a branch node. And you don't worry too much about the quality of the pruning just because you know those branches are on there in a temporary sense just for a few years. This is a better example of how that looks. So here's some street trees that were planted as nursery trees early in their life they tipped back or they cut back these low uh, branches on the trunk, but they kept them on there. And now maybe four or five, six years later, they're ready to start removing these low branches. And now they're gradually moving that canopy up to accommodate that sidewalk and that street clearance. Let's just note right now that for most sidewalks, codes are typically at least eight feet above a sidewalk, sometimes 10 or 12. And then on streets, uh, it can vary by code and by the type of street you're on, but usually at least 12 feet and over a major uh, arterial street, probably 16 feet, you don't want trunks over the middle of that uh, road, or excuse me, canopy over that road. So we got to be pretty smart about how we raise the canopy up. It takes time to get there. Top heavy nursery trees. This is how nursery trees used to be uh, aggressively uh, produced and we're getting away from that a little bit. Nursery production now has shifted to trying to retain more of these low branches for all the benefits we just talked about. Hey, Justin. Yep, Graham. A quick fact on that last slide. The most common area that the trees fail that were nursery grown is that is that spot in between where a homeowner is no longer comfortable doing the pruning work and when an arborist is able to come in and do it. So 10, 12, 15 feet, somewhere in there, um, that's where branch failures usually happen because we have this uh, in-between phase where the person that bought and planted the tree in front of their house, uh, they're no longer able to reach uh, the tree where the pruning needs to be done and they haven't gotten an arborist in there quick enough to address the problem. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, That so that 10 to 15 foot area is where we really got to be smart in how we think it through, get some help if we need it. Yeah. Okay, every tree doesn't have to be pruned up in the landscape. Uh, so maybe you have a linden that's in the back part of the property. You don't, they love to sweep the ground with their low branches and they're uh, programmed to do that genetically. So just let a linden be. Even here in the middle, that's a silver linden on East Campus, and they're letting some low branches sweep the, the ground, even near some sidewalks. You know, this is America. We can have fun with it if you want, so uh, be careful about how you do that pruning, but some trees, let them be if they're in the back of the property or out of the way. Generally speaking, evergreen trees, we don't limb up 
if at all possible, to not do that. Don't limb them up to mow under or any of that. We're just going to shortchange the lives of our evergreens when we do that. But be aware that evergreens, as they mature, will self-limb. They'll drop some of their under uh, canopy branches as they get shaded out. And you can start to make them street tree, or excuse me, shade trees over time. I love this picture on the left. This is ponderosa pine. And in Western Nebraska, we would be smart to grow more ponderosa pines as shade trees. And we might be pruning them up a little more aggressively uh, in the landscape. Another objective is just to remove problematic branches up in the canopy, even though there may not be a competing leader per se, you may have other uh, branches turning back against each other, rubbing, half broken. So you might get into that canopy and clean things up, so to speak, or maybe you're trying to set scaffold limbs at appropriate distance apart. Graham, do you have any thoughts on setting those uh, scaffold lateral branches at, a, at the right distance apart or? Yeah, I think that 18 inches is pretty good. We just wanna think about how, how wide is that branch going to potentially grow if we allow it to and giving it enough space where we don't have branches so close that they're gonna become uh, co-dominant or have that bark inclusion that you mentioned earlier on. And if they're growing right into each other as they mature, so right where my cursor is, maybe you take that lower branch off so it's not going to be rubbing into that other one as they get bigger. Yeah, you can consider some reduction cuts if you just want to reduce the 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 uh, the future size that that branch is capable of. So you know, if if you're reaching the end of your pruning dose, like how much you could take off, then uh, maybe consider a reduction cut. Uh, the one other thing I'll mention here is that we don't always have to do all the work on a branch at one time. We can do a reduction cut just to slow it down for a while and take it out later if we need to. All right, let's move along and let's look at these reduction cuts and removal cuts pretty quickly here so we can get wrapped up. But there are other things to think about. Do you clean the canopy? Generally not, Graham, right? Unless there's a problem up in the canopy. We're not trying to thin the canopy. Uh, restoration pruning is a whole nother topic after a storm, but you generally want to cut back to a branch node, even if it's just a tiny bud or a small side branch, that's better than just cutting it right in the middle uh, between two nodes. Pruning is a process done over time. Like Graham just said, it's not one and done. Set those objectives early. Try to come back to the tree fairly often. It may take several years to get done what you want to do, but don't be afraid to put down the saw and not over prune if you can avoid it. And make good cuts. This is a slide just about the pruning cycle. How often are you gonna come back to the tree? If it's in your yard, you can probably do something every year. But if you're a park manager and you have 400 trees, you're gonna be lucky to get back to them every five years. So just be aware of that with your trees as you're thinking it through, you may do heavier pruning uh, when you got a lot more trees to do. You may do heavier pruning on one tree at any one time or in warmer climates, that cycle dose is a little quicker as well. In my opinion, uh, is perfection the goal? No, I love it that we have some trees in the landscape that are just weird and oddly growing. We don't want them to be hazardous trees, but this cork tree on the left has a branch that comes out 50 to 60 feet and it's a character tree at the Morton Arboretum. How about this white oak in Connecticut? Holy cow. Why would you prune on that just to make it structurally sound? Let's get into these techniques now real quickly so we can wrap up with some examples. Um, a lot of the pruning that was done earlier in time, 40 or 50 years ago, was uh, flush cuts, topping, and tipping. And we got away from that thanks to the research of Dr. Alex Shigo and some other people who created this concept of natural target pruning, looking at the tree uh, biologically to see where is the best place to make the cut. And it really makes a difference in tree health if we practice target pruning. Shigo's research showed that we want to do target cuts instead of flush cuts. And then he came up with this term coded or the com compartmentalization of decay in trees. And that's the idea that where you make that cut, the tree is not healing over that wound like you and I do, 
but they're compartmentalizing that wound with new woody growth above, below, and the sides, and then rounding it over over time if they have enough time to heal that wound. They wall off the decay. And it's really critical to cut these branches at, at the perfect spot or the best spot to help that walling off or that coat it happen. Cut just outside the branch collar and the branch bark ridge. It's a little stub, uh, right, or it's a little swollen area right at the um, trunk of the tree. Can you see that a little bit here? The swollen area here is called the branch collar. This is a deciduous tree. Here's the branch bark ridge. And you generally don't want to cut into either one of these things. The other thing we learned is that cutting line is usually more perpendicular to the branch you're cutting off, not so much at an angle. You want to end up with a, a round cut on most cuts, not all of them. Here on the left is a conifer, and conifers often show that branch collar really clearly, so you can really see where that saw is going to be on that, just on the outside of that collar. Now, my suggestion to you is it's better to leave a little stub and be a little too far out than to be too far in, but go for it, Graham. Yeah, you bet. So one thing on the on the branch collar, part of the reason that the collar of the branch is usually wider is because we have growth from the trunk overlapping with growth from the from the bark to create that thickness. So when you cut into the collar, you're actually cutting into the trunk of the tree. Uh, we also did have a question in the chat about storm damage during the summertime. And uh, if we're cutting out that storm damage, should we paint that that wound? After we uh, after we make the cut, Justin, I have a slide on painting here at the end, but we can talk okay. about it right now. Yeah, either don't way, we can wounds, get to it. And don't paint wounds except for one uh, caveat, and that's if you're dealing with oak wilt in an area. So yeah, and and that was the caveat that Kent mentioned in his question for preventing oak wilt disease. Good work, guys. Thanks yeah. for covering that in the chat. Yep. Sometimes it's these dead branches that show us right where to make the cut. If you have a dead branch on a tree, it'll swell around the base of that branch collar back at the trunk, and you'll really see where you can make the best cut on a dead branch. Always cut back to a branch union or a prominent bud or note, except if there was some storm damage that you really don't have a better spot to cut it back to. This is that concept that Graham mentioned earlier of reduction cut versus a removal cut. It used to be that we practiced primarily only doing removal cuts on a tree, pruning back a smaller branch back to the trunk or a parent branch. But as we've learned to try and reduce the uh, tendency of co-dominant stems, we do a lot more reduction cutting or subordination cutting. And that's this idea of you're taking that main branch, you're cutting it back to a smaller side node to shorten the length and the weight of that branch or that stem. Does that make sense? Here's how that reduction cut might look like in practice. You're kind of bisecting this angle between the perpendicular cut and the branch bark ridge. That's not a perfect rule or a hard rule or a perfect degree angle, but you're gonna primarily make that cut roughly in this general area where the dashed line is. I'd probably be a little higher myself because I feel like I might be cutting into uh, trunk wood there a little bit, right, Graham? Yeah, I'd say, you know, it, it's really hard to find a good angle in those kind of situations. And you're just going to have to do your best and cross your fingers. Cross your, yeah, a lot of crossing of the fingers. When you take a branch off, anything that's about an inch bigger around or so than, than that, and you can't just hold it with your hand while you cut it, Try to use this three cut method where they make a first and undercut about several inches from the trunk. The second cut is the top cut where you're going to cut the branch off outside of that undercut. That way, if it rips out, it stops at this undercut. And then the final cut is back here closer to the trunk. This particular dashed line in this image is not good. I would make the dashed line about right through here myself. So. Let's see what that looks like here. This is from the Morton Arboretum showing how this might work on a branch. What do you think the tree is here? If you can read the label, my guess is swamp white oak. But here they're doing the undercut several inches out from the branch, or excuse me, from the trunk. And then they're coming back in to do the 
uh, primary cut beyond that undercut. You can see that it ripped out a little bit underneath here. So it was good that they had the undercut. And then they sawed it off at an angle, at the right angle perpendicular to the branch coming off closer to the trunk outside of the branch collar. This undercut is critically important as shown in these kinds of images here. Here's what that good cut finally looks like. It's more of a round shape. Uh, then what do we call it? If it unround, I guess that's oblong. Good cuts cover over the wound with round donuts of callous tissues. And here on the right, you'll see that wound closure process over time, if you've done it right, on a pretty big branch. Hey, Graham, should we worry about any sap bleeding this time of year? I'm going to start this up here. You can see this video on the right. I, I'm not super worried about it. Um, and I don't think there's a whole lot of sap flow happening in trees just yet. So another good reason to get out there and get some pruning done here before things really uh, kick off for the season. What are your thoughts? I don't worry about sap flow from a pruning cut. There used to be some concern about that, I read, but I've uh, been on a couple of uh, pruning education events here recently that said, don't worry about it. Especially So right now the sap is flowing, especially in sugar maple or red maple, silver maple. It's just going to come out this time of year. Don't worry about it. This is definitely the reason we talk about not pruning oaks and elms in the, you know, the warm months of the year, because that sap flow is um, attractive to beetles that spread disease for those trees. Exactly. Good, good point, Graham. So anyhow, try to prune branches when they're small, generally less than three inches in diameter or so. That's a good size for a homeowner or a novice. When you take off big branches on big trees, some species, especially your liable to get decay going. Look at this yellow wood on campus, where for some reason they took this branch out several years ago. They made a good cut at the right angle, but it still invited all this decay back into the trunk of that yellow wood. And yellow woods are notorious for that. So these trees are just examples of it's too late to make these cuts here, here, or here, or here, or here, or here. We might reduce weight up in the canopy of the tree if we think that's a concern, but it's too late to, to make these reduction cuts at the uh, trunk union or removal cuts, excuse me. One bit of advice I would encourage you to do is step back from the tree before you prune, look at it from all angles. And while you're pruning, walk around the tree and look uh, pretty often because you're going to be surprised at how much it's going to look a little different from a different angle. We talked about crown thinning being unnecessary, lion's tailing and crown thinning. Don't do it. That's another practice that went away once we learned how uh, trees actually function and resist storm damage. Lion's tailing ends up with trees foliage concentrated at the tips, and it becomes more heavy branches that are more prone to storm damage, uh, and especially when they're grown out in the wide open. There's nothing to prune these trees back to if they get damaged in a storm. You're going to have to take that whole limb off back at the trunk. When to prune. Anytime is okay. We just talked about this. Late winter, early spring is preferred. And then avoid spring pruning of oaks and native elms if oak wilt or Dutch elm disease is a concern. And that brings us to this comment of wound painting. Uh, on the left is an image of how they used to do uh, follow-up care, when they cut a branch off, almost a uh, flush cut, they would do this wound tracing thing where they would cut out part of the brank, uh, trunk tissue in a diamond-shaped pattern around it. They don't do that anymore. That's stupid. That causes way more harm than good. And then paint uh, painting of uh, branch cuts used to be pretty common. There's stuff called tree wound dressing. Don't use it, except the one caveat. If you have oak wilt in your neighborhood and you prune in the spring, yes, that's when you're going to want to use uh, a paint to cover up that wound because that wound, that open wound, attracts the beetles that bring the fungal disease that causes oak wilt. They can smell it a mile away. And if you paint over that wound, uh, 
the pheromones or whatever coming out of that wound aren't attractive to those beetles like they would normally be, right, Graham? Is there? Yeah, yeah. So just, you know, best case scenario, we just avoid having to prune those trees that time of year. If you're backed into a corner, you're cleaning up storm damage or something like that. That's the one case where this stuff can be worth uh, turning to. So in general, would you say red oaks and elms, uh, American elms, red oaks and American elms prune late summer, fall? Yeah, I mean, during the dormant season, or at least, um, you know, when sap flow is going to be minimal. Very good. Here's pruning tools to think about. Use the smallest tool to do the job. A smaller tool is easier to keep sharp and uh, makes a cleaner cut. So if you're using a handsaw or loppers or things to get small branches, that's usually better than a great big saw. Here's what I use generally. I like the Silky Super Excel folding saw. I like the ARS bypass pruners. I do 90% of my pruning with these two tools, but I do have a wonderful Silky pole saw that I can get 18, in, 18 feet up into the canopy of the tree. And with a sharp blade, wow, that really takes them off easily. I've moved into powered pole saws a little bit because it takes a lot of the work out and they're getting really good at the production and quality of these things. I use a bypass pole pruner for small limbs up to 15 feet into the tree. And then sometimes I use a chainsaw when I'm cleaning up storm damage or a limb got way too big on me. Okay, as we wrap up here, thank you for your time and attention here. We're gonna look at just a few trees to quickly take a gander at to say, what should we do with these things? Here's one on campus. This is a sugar maple. And in my experience, sugar maples are notorious for getting double uh, competing leaders and, and really tight crotch angles early in their life, lower in the canopy. Not all sugar maples do that, but just be aware that you, this is a species you're gonna wanna watch. So here we have one on campus here. This branch got a little too big, this competing leader on the right. It's got included bark in it now, so that's a weak branch attachment. What would you do at this point? What would you do, Graham? Sorry, I'm in the chat a second. Um, oh, that's all right. Well, I'll oh, I, yeah, I would. I, exactly. I, I would reduce that branch back to an, a good lateral like you show here, rather than trying to take the branch all the way out. All right. Good work. Yep. Here's one near campus, a swamp white oak. It's got three competing leaders in it. And you can really see how that included bark is very prominent now between three different trunks. Uh, kind of a disaster all of a sudden, isn't it? But it's still small enough tree that they, I think they can arrest this and make it a better tree. So here's just what I would do looking up into this canopy. This uh, competing leader off to the right here, I would cut back to this branch union here. So that's a reduction cut, taking the weight off of this leader. And then I'd look at this other one on the other side and try to do the same thing uh, at the right point. It might even be a little higher in the canopy for a few years. And then maybe I'm even doing it up here this year and coming back in three years and cutting it back further down below. Maybe the other side of this, the branch union isn't quite as bad and I don't feel bad for taking off the whole branch, but I didn't have the nerve to walk up to their front door to figure out what it looks like. So what do you think there, Graham? Yeah, same. I think that that makes a lot of sense. You're you're just gonna you're gonna have nothing but problems if you keep all three of those leaders and don't let slow some of them down. <clears throat> Here's a red maple out on the street in Lincoln. Here on the left, you can see we've got two or three now competing leaders going on from a all coming out from a same point of the the branch or the trunk, and you can see how the original central leader of this tree was lost or suppressed somehow several years ago, shortly after planting, and then these side buds took off and became the new leaders. So here's what I would do just right up front. There's three leaders here competing. I'm gonna take this one off completely. And then one of these other two are gonna be the primary leader that I'm gonna hold on to. I might be able to take this whole uh, second leader off right with a good cut right here where we have the problem. But I also might come up here in the canopy and take it off 
reduce that uh, leader back a little bit for a couple of years, not take off quite as much uh, foliage and branching in the tree, and then try to address it again a year or two later. Thoughts, Graham? Um, yeah, sorry, I've got a lot going on in the chat right now. Okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> you heard the expert opinion here. It has to be right if Justin said it. So exactly. Fun one on the uh, borough uh, near East Campus here in Lincoln. Uh, look at what happened here. For some reason, two competing leaders got grown. In fact, what I can tell is going on here. The original trunk had a little bit of a crook in it for some reason. And then the side branch took off and it has become the primary dominant leader now. And the original uh, part of the, the main leader in this nursery tree is now off to the left, but it started to shoot upwards as well. So you have two competing leaders. It's a little hard to tell right here exactly what I do, but I wanna get all of this off, either in one cut or maybe over a couple of years if I'm worried about it being too big of a wound. But I think I can get a good cut right through here, just bite the bullet and do it now and get rid of all this part of the uh, competing uh, system of that tree. Here's a ginkgo on campus. Ginkgos are notorious for uh, low canopy branching all at a single spot or two. And then, but this is a species that seems to tolerate that. I've, I don't run into too many ginkgos that come apart in storms even though they have all this branching going on tightly together. They don't always end up with a lot of included bark. So it's not the disaster it would be if it was a maple, but I would still try to get into this tree and take off some of these low uh, competing, low hanging branches. We're in a parking lot, so we wanna raise the canopy up a little over time. And I'm probably gonna take off three or four of these low uh, competing stems here this first year. I'm gonna get up into this canopy a little bit and maybe pinch back a few of these to try and force more energy and growth into that central leader, if that makes sense to you. And this would probably be a tree that I would make a project over six to eight different pruning cycles, not just one. Beech trees, beech trees kind of like yellow wood are really hard a uh, head scratcher to think about because you'll never get all the competing leaders or a central leader all the way up into that canopy. So, you know, um, cut your losses early in the life of a beech tree. Don't go for perfection in a beech tree, but I can see branches here that are too close together in a scaffold permanence uh, sense. So I'd probably be wanting to cut out a couple of these that aren't haven't gotten too big yet. But once they get six to eight inches in round, I wouldn't mess with a beech tree. They have a lot of decay going back into the canopy or into the trunk. And then small ornamental trees and multi-stem trees. This is a crab apple in a parking lot here on East Campus. They've done a good job getting it to this height that's about 12 feet in the air now. Again, this is a tree that genetically is gonna be smaller. You can try to force it to be a single stem, but you're working against its genetic tendencies. And I think they've done a good job on this crab apple. They're gonna to have to watch side branching uh, going forward a little bit to make sure it's not getting into cars or the uh, driveways, but there's not a whole lot more to do on this, even though they have all this branching right at that one spot. Those are pretty left. good connections. Okay. Have you yeah, ever since you left? I say you're not going. Yeah, Justin, I agree with you here. And the other thing to keep in mind in terms of maintaining a strong leader in a tree is for crab apples that have a small mature size, the stakes are so low. We're not talking about a tree that's ever going to crush a car or hurt a person in a major way. And so the, you know, when we're talking about large shade trees, the risk potential is much greater than a little ornamental tree like this. So uh, trying to fit a square peg in a round hole isn't quite as necessary with these little trees. Fantastic, Graham. That was right on target. And then on the magnolia on the right, that's just an image to show you that some of our trees are multi-trunked ornamental trees. A service berry, a red bud, a magnolia, a birch tree can be growing like this. And it's just a different animal when it comes to pruning because you don't want to get a lot of clearance underneath that tree for any reason. Otherwise, you've picked the wrong tree. So you still got to make good cuts. And this is probably a little bit more of art than science. 
it can take the form you want it to take. Just take make good cuts and make cuts when the small when the branches are small. So final thought here, pruning is an art and a science informed by practice. Trees are complex living things, so don't expect perfection. Like Graham said earlier, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And it's an ongoing process. Try to come back to those trees over time. Okay, this is the last slide. Just as a reminder, Graham, uh, certified arborist, we're going to have you fill out a form and you're going to need to have your certification number. The ISA certification number should look something like this, Midwest-4611A, or the NAA arborists are just a five-digit number. You got to have that right, though, or they're not going to count it. So, yeah, if you if you're not exactly sure about your arborist number, uh, don't guess. Uh, just write down on file or unsure, and uh, the appropriate organization will look that up. So, in the chat, you can find the link for your CEU form. You can also give us some feedback there if you have any any thoughts on how Justin can do better, or, yeah. how, or how amazing that we are at this stuff. So, um, the um, Along the bottom, there's a, a button that says chat. You click that, and then you'll see the link at the very bottom of the chat that you can use to get your CEU information entered. And we'll need to stay on the line for a little while, right, Graham, to get yeah. that? Yep. <clears throat> we'll hang out for a bit. Um, if we see that there's nobody else um, left to uh, uh, in, the, um, in our Zoom, uh, then we'll go ahead and close things out from there. And please feel free to ask questions still as we hang on the line. We don't have to leave right now if you don't want to. <clears throat> yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we really like doing these webinars and Young Tree Printing is such an ambitious topic to try to handle in an hour. So there's, there's always more to learn and, and we're always learning more ourselves. Yep. Oops, we're viewing George's screen. I'm going to stop that sharing, George. Not that we don't want to see your screen, but uh, are there any other questions out there? Those were, it looked like we got good questions going along today and pretty good answers to them. So. Yeah, if you're filling out that form, just go ahead and stay here in the Zoom. And uh, as soon as we see that everybody's gone, we'll go ahead and close it out. You know, in, invariably, whenever we get these talks, give these talks, people have questions about their very specific tree. It's very difficult to give advice on a tree we haven't looked at or visited, but we'll do what we can. I do see a question here about a peach tree. and. Um... Graham's getting pretty good at fruit tree pruning. I know nothing about it, but we are going to do a fruit tree pruning workshop uh, April, I think it's April 4th at Nebraska City. But anyhow, get on the Nebraska Forest Service events page and look that up. And we're going to, you'll get any kind of fruit tree pruning you want out of that. But do you have any quick thoughts on a peach pruning, Graham? Yeah, I, 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 I don't really. I know peaches. I mean, Lisa, I don't know if you're in the Nebraska area or some in a, some other part of the country, but peaches are a real ambitious effort around here uh, in Omaha. OK, um, I know if, if Pete Smith is still on, I know he's got some some thoughts on fruit tree pruning as well. Uh, but generally, I'd say you, you just there's a lot of good references online on how to get good structure in fruit trees. Uh, but we are breaking a lot of the rules that we apply to shade trees. Right with fruit trees. So some of the information that we uh, went over today on uh, pruning shade trees for good structure is just not going to apply to fruit trees. So uh, a whole different animal with, with that particular plant. And like I mentioned, we'll do a workshop uh, April 4th, I think it is, for fruit tree pruning. All kinds, everything you want to know about the edible landscape, fruit tree establishment, trees and shrubs. That's going to be at Nebraska City, if I get my event page to load up. Yeah, uh, there's a question here about removing stakes. I would say if you need a stake on a tree more than maybe one or two growing seasons, there's something really wrong with the root system. 
Um, so after about a year or two, if that tree still has a lot of give and it's moving around like a like a arcade joystick, yeah. uh, then you probably have a root system that's not rooting out like wagon wheel spokes as it should, and you have bigger problem. Yeah, you might want to dig that tree up and see if it can be salvaged or yeah. cross your fingers. Yep. Yep. And that would definitely be a dormant season type of activity if you're resorting to something like that. Yeah. Uh, he says, glad to have this info for my 10 young trees. Princeton Elm will be the most challenging uh, with competing leaders. Yeah, as Justin mentioned, that 30% pruning dose that we typically want to stick to for a single visit pruning a tree, we can almost double that for some of these hybrid elms that are out there. Uh, do you like Princeton, Justin? Yeah, it's a good one for, uh, in terms of American elm use, it's pretty good. But it has a lot of really tight, uh, arching stems that come out close to each other. So it needs aggressive pruning, yeah. Yeah, think about your branch spacing along the stem of the tree, along the trunk, um, so that you don't have too many branches that are right next to each other trying to grow big and thick and uh, establish that, that leader as best you can. Yeah. Yeah, it is a fun topic, Justin. You did a great job. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your help here. Yeah, yeah. It takes it takes at least two to do these Zoom things <laughs> right. Right on, especially to all the questions in the chat. And our, we're able to um, download the chat, right? Yeah, the chat we'll, we'll have afterwards, and um, we'll see how we're doing on getting those uh, CEU responses. But again, even if you're not a certified arborist, you don't need the CEUs. You can use this link here just to give us a little feedback on how the webinar went for you. I did quite a bit of pruning on my pear tree in the backyard recently too, just knowing that we're warming up and we're inevitably gonna cool off again, just like we did yesterday. But um, yeah, you, you can't wait too late in the season for that because then you get all this sprouting and you're you're creating even more work to do uh, moving forward. So, And I think with apple trees, they wanted to be pruned here in the last few weeks, right? Most orchards. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back to that, that sprouting response. If you're pruning fruit trees in the summertime when you're going to get a lot more sprouting behind those cuts, then you have all these branches that are going to want to have fruit on them and they're not big enough and strong enough and the tree's spreading its energy amongst uh, too much fruit. Yep. But I'm still definitely a novice when it comes to the fruit tree concepts. We're going to nail it, though, on April 4th at Nebraska City at the Kimmel Orchard. Uh, we're going to get toured by the Kimmel Orchard site manager, and he'll have a lot of great ideas, too, about pruning. Yeah, yeah. And we're fortunate to have a couple of coworkers that have a lot of orchard experience that will be joining us, too, to to present on the, that topic, so. Will, I hope everything's going good in Hastings. Gentlemen, there's another uh, question in the chat. Oh, I missed that. At the very end. Uh, Two-year-old hackberry eventually need lower branches removed to raise the canopy. If I take the very lowest off now, will that help or hurt the remaining branches? Um, Mary, you can consider removing those low branches entirely if you want to. If it seems like a, a lot of pr uh, pruning dose for one time, then just do some reduction cuts on those branches and then take them off the rest of the way down the road. Backberry is pretty forgiving, especially if it's uh, growing robustly. Yeah, and I did get a, a direct message uh, from Kent about taking volunteers out from the base of conifers. Boy, that's a tough one, because if you just prune those out, they're going to sprout very vigorously, and you're not uh, finishing the job with just mechanical pruning. So I think a stump killer of some sort is ultimately uh, in the cards for that. <clears throat> My he's usual talking, suggest... Oh, go ahead. He's talking about like a mulberry or something? Yeah, mulberry volunteers at the base of your conifers. That's so, where I uh, spend most of my time in the park in Waverly, cutting out mulberries and hackberries and silver maples. Yeah, first of all, get a hoodie or something. What's that? You know, 
first of all, get your hoodie up over you. And yeah. Army crawl down in there. Under the um, spruce. Yeah. I like to be real conservative about how much stump killer that I use. So uh, a product like that, I'll usually apply with a Q-tip. And so what you want to do is cut those mulberries off maybe six to eight or 12 inches off the ground and apply that herbicide to it. If you're not getting a kill, then you have some more. You can make a fresh cut later and apply a second time. Great idea. Yeah. And I like to use triclopyr or garlon in that, not um, uh, tordon. Yeah, I don't mind Tordon, but it is definitely one that's kind of problematic and it, yeah. it can persist in the soil for a long time. If it's right up near the trunk, that's how I do it. And then if it's out away from the trunk, I usually chop them with my shovel or, well, that's what I do. If they're small enough, I can chop them with my shovel. Yeah, yeah. Will, so you're having a problem with your Princeton Elms, huh? Feel free to unmute if you want to join us for some conversation for a minute. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You you really answered it a lot, but high up where I can't get to it, but Paul Dooley with his bucket probably can. Yeah. We have all these tight V shapes. I mean, three or four or five coming out of the same area. Yeah. And my understanding is, correct me, is to try to do some reduction cuts high up so that that branch stays smaller. I don't know if you would eventually then cut it off down close to the V. Yeah, you can. I think, you can. I think Go ahead, you Justin. Nailed it. I think you nailed it there, Will. I, that's what I'm dealing with too in Waverly, yeah, yeah reduction cutting, because you'll never get rid of all the branches, right? There's too many of them. Uh, so reduction cutting, get it as high as you can in that first scaffold branching what 12 to 15 feet high and then reduce the rest yeah exactly yeah the the more those the base of those branch gets smushed together it's hard to know exactly how to prune that out all the way and so those reduction cuts is going to slow them down so they're not getting thick as quickly as they would if you didn't do anything <laughs> oh that's terrific fellows and i'll see paul dooley at two o'clock all right, all right. very good Coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and we've talked about this a lot, and if uh, he's been unsure, and I'll I'll just say, I took notes, and it, and I think it's fair to say, Will, with Princeton Elm, the jury's still out. I like it in terms of not coming apart in storms, but it has tricky branch angles, and maybe it'll prove to be a tree we don't want to use as much. I think it'll yeah. be okay, but it's going to take a lot of work. They grow incredibly fast. I'm amazed. But you were also right about the Valley Forge. We had one, and it was breaking all the time. I tried everything. You just said that exactly correct. Yeah. It, Valley Forge doesn't work. It, Justin, is Valley Forge one of those with some Siberian elm genetics in it? No, not technically that I'm aware of, but they came out of the National Arboretum Valley Forge in New Harmony. And for some reason, they have this weird lateral growth that the stems are way too heavy and they just rip rip out of you can't stop it it's weird yeah and we have a new harmony elm right next to our princeton's and the new harmony is very much like the princeton's oh, uh, it's good. okay maybe a little better than the princeton's oh that's good to hear yeah and some of those cultivars it probably is kind of site specific how they're going to uh, develop right yeah. if they're drier or wetter i know we did some hackberry and street medians where we amended the soil and we watered the trees really well and the hackberries were in those situations were actually growing too big and fast for their own good we had leaders snapping out of them and all that where really all they probably needed in the case of hackberry is decompacting the soil hackberry is really sensitive to compacted soil and all the all the compost and the extra water was just too much of a good thing for that tree. Yeah. Practice tough love with elms and hackberries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they got spoiled. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm not seeing any more responses coming in on the CEU form. Um, so if any if if you if you're not filling out the form and you don't have any further questions for us. Uh, go ahead and, and and leave the Zoom, 
and uh, we'll uh, close that form up here in just a few minutes. Yeah. Anything else on your mind, Will? Uh, just thank you, both of you. Oh, we love that. love to have you come out and visit. Yeah, let's plan on it this spring. Do you have an Arbor Day event planned? Or thank you, we do, and it is Arbor Day Friday at nine a.m. and it's a ginkgo for a former professor who I had. So, oh, oh wow. wow. The contribution was by a fellow I played in band with, and he wants a ginkgo. All right. Perfect. And good. she was, uh, the professor was a Bach aficionado, and we're going to have Bach music as part of the memorial service. Oh, cool. Bach. Yeah. Wow. Where are you planting <laughs> the tree? Uh, just southwest of Four Hall, the music building. Okay. okay. Nice. Yeah. We don't think any parking lots will ever go there. Yeah. <laughs> but you also talked about the challenge of pruning ginkgos. Yeah, they just want to be ahead of broccoli, was, more or less. That was good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead of broccoli. But they yeah. don't seem to be as problematic in terms of uh, included bark and structural right. problems, despite yeah. their head of broccoli nature. That's weird <laughs> to me. Yeah. 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 You know, ever since COVID lockdown, I haven't been getting as many requests for help with Arbor Day events. And I've been really encouraging some communities to try to get away from that Friday or Saturday so that those of us that want to help have the time to because uh, the day of gets pretty crazy. But we're always glad to help with that kind of stuff whenever we can. Well, if you're out this way on Friday morning, I don't know when the city planting will be. Um, I I haven't talked to Jeff Hassenstab about it. Probably not as early as nine in the morning. Yeah. They might come out to us on yes. camp for the ginkgo. Yeah, send an invite at some point, Will. I'd, I'd definitely like to try and be there. Well, Friday, Arbor Day at nine. nine right outside of Fort Hall. Right. The weather's bad. We'll be inside. Yeah, you know, I think Arbor Day, I, I know Pete Smith left already, but I think Arbor Day Foundation has a page where you can uh, submit your plans for Arbor Day celebration. Um, and I, I hate to reinvent the wheel if they do have that in place already, but it'd be cool if we had a page where everybody could kind of log in and say, hey, this is what we're doing for Arbor Day. And then everybody could look that stuff up. But uh Otherwise, um, yeah, I think I think we're about done. Uh, Mary, George, Sarah, Candace, Anna, uh, are any of you guys doing the CEU form? Please just let me know. Either unmute yourself or let me know in the chat. Because I don't want to shut things down uh, before anybody's finished. Thank you, Mary. Graham, I did lose my, I lost both my chat line and uh much of the audio so okay so i did not uh, sign up well at the very bottom of your screen there's a there's a little uh button that says chat if you click that it'll I, open I, I i lost the line at the bottom magic of george ocker's computer oh yeah so um one five six nine three is my number yeah i got you here george we'll make sure you get good enough it. okay very good. See you, Kim, see you down in uh, Kimmel Orchard. Oh, great. Good, yeah, we'll see you then. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. Get out and prune some elms, George. <laughs> They're just like a bat, bunch of nasty three-year-olds. Yeah. You just have to smack them hard. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Prairie Expedition is also a beast. Yeah, they just want to be kind of a shrub on a stick, don't they? Yeah, and and they branch just and and break worse than the Valley Forge. Okay. Okay, Prairie Expedition. Yeah, I haven't messed with that one. Oh, and our 1883 American Elm, the Hastings College American Elm, still seems good. Yeah. Nice. Just uh, 
Still chugging along. That's so cool. Anna, are you having any trouble with the CEU form or you just need a little more time? All right. Well, I don't need to close the CEU form, but we could um, close out the Zoom if you like, Justin. Yep. I think it's time to do that. All right. Very good. good seeing you today, Will. Everybody else. That was awesome. Yeah, you bet. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Graham. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Miguel.